Precedentemente, nell'ottavo podcast del viaggiatore eclettico... Please, uh, call me. I need you to pick me up. I'm on the airport. Next in line. Oh, yeah, sorry. Just a second. What do you mean, no? No, I didn't say no. I just said give me a second. Where am I? Sir? 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 <sighs> Sir, I am sorry, but I need you to fasten your seatbelt. We will land in a couple minutes. Thank you. Oh my gosh. This is creepy. <sighs> Buenas noches a todos los pasajeros del Flight 666-666 a Barcelona. Me gustaría informarles que las turbulences que estamos undergoing son solo momentary. Por favor, mantenga sus cinturones abrochados y por su seguridad no se levanten de los asientos. Muchas gracias. Um, um, gosh. What can I do for you? I am... Just some water, please. Some water. I'm afraid you'll have to wait until we don't experience more turbulences. As the captain said, they are only momentary. So please, don't be afraid. No, I'm, I'm not afraid. I just need some water, please. Just some water. I understand you are irritated, but I promise I will bring you a cup of water after getting through the turbulences. Okay? Thank you. Hey, I've heard you asking for water. Here, I got some for you. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Can I ask you a question? Oh, thank you. Maybe you ask yourself why you think the way you think. I'm so sorry. It's just so random. I know, but cope with me, please. I'm sorry, though. I don't know. Why don't you tell me? Exactly. Exactly. Think about it. Ideas become behaviors, and behaviors shape futures. Maybe we can talk after this. Ugh. Are you afraid? Shouldn't I be afraid? This looks pretty bad to me. If I tell you this isn't real, would you still be afraid? What are you, talk what are you talking about? Ideas are made from experiences, which are made from moments. Moments like this. Excuse me, what are you talking about? What you live now and who you interact with will determine how you live and how you interact with others. Who are you? Listen, I don't have much time. I need you to question your ideas, where they came from, how you got them. Try to find out if your mind has been hijacked by other people that don't want you to think. Question these people and these ideas. Wait, wait! Time is running out. I want you to question even me. Why would I want you to think this way? I gotta go. But the one, one more thing, what is going to happen next? It's not real. Wait, what? Wait. What? podcast vam je bio predstavljen od Eclectic Travelerja. Just like the movie Inception, where an idea is inserted without the person ever noticing, our social institutions, especially the educational one, has taught us unconsciously, in the very same way, that we don't need to know how to think. Rather, we will always have someone who can tell us what to think and how to think. We don't even need to question the legitimacy of the information given because someone else has done that for us. Basically no risk and very limited choice. After years of consistently memorizing and regurgitating information, we become less efficient at answering questions such as why do we think the way we do? Can we trace a particular idea of thinking back to its origin? What are the ideas or beliefs that are part of our collective unconscious? How is the school teaching me solve real life problems? Noam Chomsky in 1989 answered the question of what education represents these days. And it basically hasn't changed after all these years. What it does and how it functions. Listen carefully. Uh, so the educational system is supposed to train people to be uh, obedient, conformist, uh, not think too much, uh, do what you're told, stay passive, don't cause any crises of democracy, don't raise any questions, and so on. That's basically what the, what the uh, system is about. Uh, even the fact that the system has a lot of stupidity in it, I think, has a function. 
You know, it means that people are filtered out for obedience. If you can guarantee lots of stupidity in the educational system, you know, like stupid assignments and things like that, you know that the only people who will make it through are people like me and like most of you, I guess, who are willing to do it no matter how stupid it is because we'll, we want to go to the next step, you know. So you may know that this assignment is idiotic and the guy up there couldn't think his way out of a paper bag, but you'll do it anyway uh, because that's the way you get to the next class. To make it more even implicit, listen to what he adds on. And I, have, I don't know how to prove this, but I have a feeling that when you go to the elite universities, you find more obedience and conformity probably because you're getting the students who were better able to do it. You know. The core of our education these days is not based on a recalibration of questions and answers in relation to the students' answers and needs, nor mentoring is offered with the dude education, nor with the explanations that can be relatable to the student. We are in an age of mass production, and in such we are mass producing individuals with the same old blueprint, without thinking that human beings differ from other humans through different backgrounds, perceptions of reality, desires, and wants. Therefore, a human being is bound to a diverse level of struggle when learning about a topic. Thus, a different approach is needed for a meaningful educational experience. Wait, what? Not everybody answers the same way. Not everybody learns through the same explanation techniques or teaching methods. Now, think of a situation where you get to ask a professor a question about a topic. He or she answers it in a way that you sort of understand it. Therefore, you ask again to make it clear, and you still don't get it. And the professor still shares the same analogy, but with a slightly different variation. And you still don't get it, and you ask again, and you don't get it, and you ask again. In scenarios like this, the professor will likely say, well, don't worry, you'll get it down the road, or even worse, he or she will explain it in such a higher level of ambiguity to discourage you from ever asking again, or to ask more questions. So if you're the student, you're very likely to give up before reaching to understand the topic, because the teacher has not been able to solve the question in a manner that you understand. And then the professor has to move on with the curriculum. Too late. If you want to get an answer, you'll have to ask someone else. But don't interrupt the curriculum pace or the professor lecturing the class. This has to do with a teacher-centered model. It tends to make students passive in their learning. Thus, you will lie to yourself and say, I'll understand it later. I won't worry about it. But you might ask yourself, but well, there are so many teachers that are pretty good at lecturing. What's the problem? Well, that's true. And when a classroom is based on a professor being the main source of information and example, it's called a teacher-centered model. While you indeed move faster through the curriculum, the professor and the institution won't be able to ensure that the students have reached the proper understanding of the topics. In other words, we don't really know if a student deserves to move on or not. Quizzes and tests are used with the intention to supposedly solve this problem, but what if the student passed the course because it figured out the easiest path to a passing grade while being unnoticed by the professor? Or he or she just memorized the material a day before, thus ensuring the best possible grade the system can offer? It is so unnatural to give students quizzes and exams because we don't face quizzes nor multiple option tests in real life. In fact, I would suggest that it kills creativity because it forces us to think the way the person who created these quizzes or wrote these quizzes and tests was thinking at that time. Therefore, a teacher-centered model perpetrates intended or unintended a cycle of passiveness, secureness, and limited freedom, rewarding students who have memorized and regurgitated the content enough to claim some fluency on the topic, or even solving the problem that was already solved before. It's not even a problem. This environment can't produce authentic creative thinking, because our minds have this implemented idea that there is only one way to do it, and that's the way that the professor teaches it. But these days, who cares about critical thinking? or thinking creatively or outside of the box. Right, Marco Rubio? We need more welders and less philosophers. Understanding why you think the way you think and why you solve current problems the way you do is crucial in order to improve upon. Mastering a physical skill, such as welding, cosmetologist, massage therapist, it's good and very much encouraged. But the error in this rhetoric that you just heard is that critical thinking is mutually exclusive to a given skill. In fact, you should be able to reason through anything you say and do so that you don't end up saying things like this. It's three agencies of government when I get there that are gone. Commerce, education, and the, um, uh, what's the third one there? Let's see. <laughs> okay. Now, let's talk about the next level of education model. Let's talk about student-centric 
model. In a course powered through this model, a professor plays a much different role. There are some fundamental core principles in a list of topics that you cover that accompany this model. First, the professor doesn't give any general lecture to the class about these topics. And yes, the pace at the beginning of the course is much more slower and chaotic than a lectured one. However, the professor becomes a mentor that can set you or set the student on a solid starting point so that you can go on and explore the topic yourself rather than the professor becoming the main source of information about this topic. This model also defends the freedom for the student to start with whatever topic the curriculum has, allowing much more risk in decision making than a teacher-centric model. This creates an environment that relies on creativity and critical thinking. When the student is stuck, because he or she will to some point be, the situation will enable the student to ask or not for mentoring with his or her own projection of the understanding that has gotten. Then the professor will notice individual gaps in knowledge the student has by way of listening how he or she formulates and expresses his or her ideas. Then the professor can recalibrate, meaning can reassign, reteach, or reassure the assignment, setting the student to the right track according to its own needs and its own learning method. This by far forces the professor to provide meaningful, relatable examples custom to the student needs because we all learn differently. A fundamental twist to this student-centric model comes with reaching a point where you, as a student, have to come to the professor to claim a degree of fluency on the topic you explored in order to move forward with the curriculum. This way, it's virtually impossible to go unnoticed through the class or to only rely on the work of other people without even understanding it. So this allows for the student to just discover. Noam Chomsky sums it up with this story. Right here at MIT, leading science and technology university in the world. Uh, the senior faculty teach elementary courses, as they should. Uh, one of the great physicists of the 20th century, uh, Victor Weisskopf, was famous for what he used to tell his introductory classes. I mean, if they would ask, uh, what are we going to cover this semester? He, his answer was, it doesn't matter what we cover, it matters what you discover. If you can discover things, you're on your way to being an independent thinker. And that's what education should be. I'm at the graduate level, which is mostly where I am. You don't teach and expect people to, students to answer things in tests. It's an interactive process of participation and cooperation to try to discover and learn what it means to discover. And that can be done from kindergarten to the MIT graduate courses. Professor Lee S. Barney, teaches software development courses in Brigham Young University, Idaho, and his approach is exactly this one. His classes are so uncomfortable to many students that many give up in the first couple of weeks without even really trying. Why? Because many of us have been trained to only be passive students, with little or no drive to understand the content for ourselves, only to have the intention to just pass the class whether we are perceived or not. Those students willing to undergo the painful transformation can detect flaws in themselves and become aware of why they think the way they think why they solve problems in the way they do. Because they are forced to move from their comfort zone, thus facing fear until they decide to act. Down the road, those students that endured see how limited and short-reaching teacher-centric courses are in university environments. In an article Professor Barney published together with Professor Brian D. Melgan from University of Idaho entitled Getting Out of the Way, Learning Risk and Choice, he writes that the two key principles that are much more responsible for students to move to real life scenarios with much ease are the use of agency and risk taking. They have noticed throughout years of teaching experience that these two principles and teaching environment will remarkably decrease the inception of ideas from general class lectures that limit creative thinking and strangles freedom of choice and risk taking. Professor John Taylor Gatto, also very advocate for this type of educational approach, says that when you take the free will out of education, that is when it turns into schooling. If you want to know more about this model, go to links that I put on the description below. Let us think our way out of traditional teacher-centered education. This is The Eclectic Traveler, thank you very much. Non perderti la fine del primo tempo della serie del viaggiatore eclettico.